And can I get the slides? There we go. So this is joint work with uh, several people who were at Cornell when we all started. Uh, some of us have moved on. So um, Wenlei Xia is the student who was involved in this, uh, and Aldemers and Johannes Gerke and I were uh, all supervising in some sense. Uh, Wenlei couldn't make it, so I'll be giving the talk. So for this audience, I don't really have to introduce page rank, but I will anyhow. Um, so the page rank process is thought of as a random walk, uh, where at each step you have two choices. You can either teleport to some location in the network uh, that's done independent of where you were before, and you've got a teleport probability vector, which I'll call V, that tells you the probability that you'll land on a given node. In addition, you can move along an edge from your current location to another location in the network. And we're going to think about doing that in a weighted graph, so the probability that you'll transition along a given edge is proportional to the weight of that edge. So you can write down the stationary distribution for this random process as a solution to a system of linear equations. And that's what we're going to think of as the page rank vector. So for me, this turns into AX equals B, or in this case, MX equals B, because I don't want to use A, because uh, I already think of it as the adjacency matrix. Personalization is the process of assigning parameters or varying parameters on a user by user or query by query basis in order to change the rankings that PageRank produces in order to be more relevant in a particular context. Usually we think about personalized PageRank via the teleport probability vector. So you think about biasing where you restart so that it's more relevant to a given topic or more relevant to a given individual user. Examples of this are topic sensitive page rank or personalized page rank where you're jumping to a single node. I'm going to think about a slightly different form of personalization in which we're varying not the node teleport probabilities but the edge weights. So think of having a small number of global parameters that define a parametric family of edge weights and you're allowed to vary those edge weights. The question is how do you do this fast? Let me point out that this is a fundamentally different problem from varying the teleport probabilities because when you vary the teleport probabilities, you still have a linear relationship between the teleport probability vector and the page rank vector. When you vary the edge weights, on the other hand, even if the edge weights are a linear function of your parameters, your page rank vector will not be. It's a rational function in general. So node weight personalization is pretty well studied. That's been around for as long as page rank has been around almost. Um, this edge weight personalization, the idea has certainly been introduced before. So uh, scale rank is a previous attempt at this. Um, it works for a particular type of graph that fits in this model, but not general purpose. So our goal is general fast methods that will address the edge weighted page rank problem. And so I mostly come from the land of physical simulations uh, and numerical linear algebra. And in that domain, there's a fairly common set of techniques known as model reduction. The idea behind model reduction is that you observe that the solution to some system, in this case, the solution to your page rank system, will vary within a low dimensional space or approximately within a low dimensional space as you change some set of parameters. So this is something that you can justify based on interpolation theory or you can just sample at a bunch of points and observe that it's empirically true. So the page rank model reduction process or a general model reduction process can be thought of as a two-stage thing. There's an offline stage in which you construct this empirical basis and figure out a set of equations that you're going to enforce in order to pick an element of the space as your approximate solution. The second stage is the online stage, which is the piece that you really want to go fast. That's supposed to be the piece that you do when a user makes a new query, for example. So our goal now is online, try to do this reconstruction fast, and we're willing to do a lot of expensive offline work first. The reduced basis construction is relatively straightforward. It's just SVD. Uh, there's a lot of different names for the particular construction of sample a bunch of points and do an SVD. It's known as the proper orthogonal decomposition in some communities. You can think of it as PCA. Uh, some people call it the Cajun and Louvre uh, decomposition. But essentially what we're going to do is sample our page rank vector at a number of points 
and then take the SVD of this snapshot matrix and use the dominant singular vectors as the basis for a reduced space. You can do other sampling mechanisms. That's future work. I'd be happy to talk to you offline about uh, interesting things there. Once you have your basis, you need to pick a set of equations to choose a, reduced, uh, a solution from your reduced space. Um, we're going to consider two different ways of choosing those equations. Both of them are fairly standard in the model reduction literature. The first is bubnov galerkin uh, This is a method that is quite accurate, uh, and at least in practice, and it's very fast, but there's a catch, which is you only need to, you can only do this really effectively when your parameters vary linearly, or where your edge weights vary linearly with the parameters. The other method, called DIME, short for discrete empirical interpolation method, uh, is fast even when you have a nonlinear problem. Uh, the, the speed is a little bit complicated, and I'll talk for a moment about that. Um, but there's a more complicated cost accuracy trade-off. Both of these have an error analysis behind them. In both cases, that error analysis is taken directly from the model reduction literature in the PDE setting. Um, and essentially, it consists of two pieces. One is a consistency statement that you, there exists a good solution in your space. And the other one is a stability statement that says essentially that your approximation subproblem isn't too, uh, too close to singular. You put those two things together, and you can guarantee that you're going to get good solutions by this method. So the bubnov galerkin method is simply a method in which you force the residual of your approximate solution to be orthogonal to some set of test vectors. The Bubnoff part of this says the test vectors you're going to choose are the same vectors you choose for your trial space. There's actually a family of method called petrov galerkin methods in which you choose them differently. There's interesting stuff there. That's future work. In the linear case, the bubnov galerkin method can be quite efficient because you can compute the projections that are needed in order to evaluate your reduced system offline. So if you think about m of w as being i minus alpha times a weighted linear combination of transition matrix or a weighted linear combination of stochastic matrices, your projected matrix looks like i minus alpha times the same weighted linear combination of projected versions of those uh, transition matrices, and you pre can pre-compute those projected matrices. This doesn't work, on the other hand, if you've got a more general nonlinear parameterization. So if you have a nonlinear parameterization, what can you do? What we're going to do is use the DIME method, or discrete empirical interpolation method. The idea behind interpolating is that you're going to enforce the equations as a small number of nodes inside of the network. So rather than thinking we're going to enforce the page rank equations everywhere, you're going to pick, if you've got a hundred dimensional space, a hundred or two hundred nodes, and try to enforce the balance equations there. The advantage of the dime method is that not only do you not have to do an enormous amount of work, uh, in solving the equations, you also don't have to do very much work in forming the equations. The cost of forming the equations turns out to be proportional to the neighborhood size for the neighborhoods of the nodes at which you're doing the enforcement. One of the things that's different between the physics world, where I got most of this technology, and the page rank world is because the degree of the nodes can vary by quite a bit, there's an interesting cost accuracy trade-off involved in where you choose to enforce the equations. Let's talk for a moment more about the interpolation costs. There's two different variants of this. In one variant, you can easily compute the total out degree node at a given node without actually materializing all of the edges. In that case, the cost of dime is associated with the number of incident edges on each of the nodes at which you're enforcing the page rank equations. On the other hand, if you're not able to compute a normalization factor without materializing all of the outgoing edges associated with anything that has an incoming edge for the thing that's incident, things can be a little bit more expensive. So if I'm pointed at by uh, somebody who points at everybody else in the world, then it's really expensive to enforce my equation, right? Um, <clears throat> and so Depending on the type of parameterization, you may or may not have a trick for computing this normalization efficiently. It's something to consider when choosing the variant of the method. Again, high degree nodes are expensive, but they may be very informative. And so there's a key question, which is a cost accuracy trade-off. 
I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail on this, but I do want to give you the flavor for what goes into the cost analysis or into the um, accuracy analysis. So the key for the accuracy analysis is that you want the linear equations or the linear least squares problem that's associated with the rows of the page rank problem that you've chosen to be well conditioned. And you can use the usual condition number for the uh, least squares problem. If you choose a number of nodes that's equal to your number of constraints, this turns into a subset selection problem. Uh, find, the num find the rows that are most linearly independent among the rows of m times u. Of course, you'd like that linear independence to hold no matter what happens with the choice of parameter w. Uh, that's not something we really want to do online. So as a proxy, we compute m times u for a number of different W parameters, and we do a linear, uh, or we do a QR with column pivoting over the rows of that matrix. That gives us something that tends to be relatively well behaved regardless of where we sample in the space. So it gives us a nice set of equations to enforce. It also helps to explicitly enforce the normalization condition that the sum of the page rank entries should be one. Um, that's, that's straightforward. Uh, there's a number of heuristics for the cost accuracy trade-off. I'll refer you to the paper for that, uh, or you can ask me about it offline. So what is the cost of this in the online phase? In the online phase, you really have things that are proportional to K, which is the dimension of your space, maybe proportional to the size of the neighborhoods of the nodes at which you're enforcing the equations, and proportional to the number of elements of the page rank vector that you actually care about, which may not be the whole page rank vector. Notice that nothing in here is necessarily proportional to the size of the graph. So this can scale to very large graphs. Your offline processing cost will become quite expensive if you deal with a very large graph, but your online cost only depends on the size of the space that you need to consider. Let me tell you about some results. This is for two different classes of networks. One is the DBLP citation network. That's a little bit smaller, but a little bit, or a little bit larger, but a little bit uh, less dense than the Weibo graph, which was used in the KDD Cup in 2012, I believe. It's a microblogging, Twitter-like thing in China. Um, in the DBLP network, we have weights that are associated with different edge types. Uh, this is a linear parameterization, and so we can actually compare to scale rank head-to-head. -head. Um, with Weibo, we used edge weights that are based on similarities, cosine similarities between topic distributions that are learned for each of the uh, microblog posts. You can see the singular values decay pretty nicely. So for all of our experiments, we truncated at 100 uh, singular values, so 100-dimensional space. With the Weibo graph, the, num the k of the singular values depends somewhat on the number of uh, topics that you use and the number of parameters given by these topics. Uh, this is a general picture. If you have a lot of independent parameters, you're going to have to use larger space in general. The DBLP accuracy is pretty good. I want to point out that we're looking at the Kendall Tau for the top 100. Um, you can probably do the calculation in your head that uh, the, if you got one wrong, the Kendall Tau will be uh, less than one by something like 10 to the negative fourth. Uh, so you can see that we've actually got cases where you're lower than the theoretical uh, minimum. That's because, remember, this is a random process because you do random sampling. So we did many experiments. In many of those experiments, you have no error at all. Occasionally, you have one thing that's off. Um, scale rank does much worse notice. It's on the order of 10 to the minus 1. For the dime method, we preferred uh, dime 200, which has a Kendall tau of order 10 to the minus 4th. Uh, if you're interested in the actual values, the normalized L1 is the L1 error associated with the top 100 nodes uh, divided by the L1 norm of the piece of the page rank vector associated with the top 100 nodes. The running times are pretty good. Uh, this is for computing the entire page rank vector. Notice that most of the time is in that blue part where you're actually forming the vector. The calculation time to get the coefficients is very small. It's down there at the very bottom. For Weibo, we have slightly worse accuracies, but still pretty good. Uh, it depends a little bit on the number of parameters. 
the running times are also a little bit uh, different. Uh, it costs more to compute the subsystems that you're going to enforce. That's because you've got a denser subgraph in this case. Let me show you about how this plays out in an application, learning to rank. So this is stuff that Backstrom and Leskovich did offline. We can do it online. Uh, each of your steps in a gradient descent optimization requires a page rank calculation for the objective function and a page rank calculation for each component of the gradient. Um, but we only need to look at the page rank components that are associated with the training data. Um, and so we can do the entire calculation in the reduced space. Um, and we get a very similar decay in the objective value. Uh, it's essentially indistinguishable between running with the standard method or running in the reduced space. Uh, but here's sort of the punchline. Uh, if you do bubinov galeric and you go from something that takes a couple minutes per iteration to something that takes two milliseconds. If you go with dime, it's a little bit more expensive. It's 30 milliseconds. But these are still things that are uh, things that you could conceive of doing online uh, in an interactive fashion, which is something that I think is fundamentally new. Um, there's a bunch of stuff that I don't have time to talk about. Feel free to ask me about it offline or look in the paper. Um, and Johannes is now at Microsoft. Uh, Wenlei has moved on to LinkedIn. I still think that there's lots of cool things here. So if you're interested in talking to me about collaborating on future work, I'd love to hear about it. The paper is uh, paper 117 in the proceedings, and I'll look forward to taking questions now. Questions? Hi. This is maybe a silly question, but when you are looking for the in degree and out degree of the nodes, you are considering the image eight neighborhood or the entire network, the propagation against the whole network? So you're looking at the in degree and the out degree of the node. So you look at the in degree of the nodes uh, that are adjacent to, or the in degree of the nodes that you're actually, where you're actually enforcing the page rank equation, and the out degree of the nodes that point into that. And you only care about the out degree of the nodes that point into the nodes where you're enforcing things if you need those uh, edges in order to be able to compute a normalization factor. Thank you. More questions? Could you describe a little bit more about how you pick the equations to enforce? You said sure. So there's, there's a trade-off when picking the equations between the level of uh, linear independence and the, um, and the cost. So normally, let's see. Yeah, we're, here we go. So the usual thing that we would do is uh, to do a, a QR with column pivoting, for example, to pick something that's maximally independent. And you can think about that as a greedy algorithm in which the thing that you're trying to optimize is the independence of the set that you've selected at each step. So what we do in order to uh, manage this cost accuracy trade-off is something that looks very much like QR with column pivoting, but where in addition to having a cost term that's associated with how linearly independent you are from the previous vectors, you also have a term that's associated with how expensive it is to choose this particular vector. Great. Any other questions? 